The war in Ukraine has proven that the Russian military cannot stand up to the United States armed forces in a peer conflict. And here's why. Before February 24, 2022, Russia's military was regarded as the world's second most capable fighting force. It seemed to be discarding Soviet-era incompetence and acquiring modern equipment that would be able to threaten NATO or even the United States military. After two years of war to put it to the test, Russia's military has not gotten a passing grade. While Russia has indeed proven more resilient than many international observers hoped, its armed forces have still only managed to capture a comparatively small amount of territory in eastern Ukraine at the cost of hundreds of thousands of casualties. This is not the work of a first-rate fighting force. So, what has the conflict in Ukraine revealed about the Russian military's ability to stand up to the United States armed forces? Let's find out. All modern wars begin with establishing at least air superiority. Russia's failure to do so in Ukraine has been one of the most important reasons why its campaign stalled and turned into a long war of attrition. Russia's reluctance to use its air fleet puzzled many military experts at the start of the war. As of 2022, it had the world's second largest number of total military aircraft, with 4,182. Ukraine, by contrast, only had 311. Russia should have been able to establish air superiority quickly through sheer numbers alone, but it didn't. Particularly puzzling was Russia's reluctance to deploy its latest and greatest fighter jet, the supposedly fifth-generation Su-57 Felon. Two years later, the Felon has still not seen action in Ukrainian airspace. Instead, it has only acted as a long-distance support platform from the safety of Russian airspace. This suggests that the Russian brass isn't confident in the Felon's supposedly stealth abilities and worries about it being shot down by enemy aircraft or air defense systems. Russia is clearly afraid of losing the Su-57 and damaging the plane's prestige. It also only has 22 of them. 76 are supposed to be delivered, but given sanctions, that order will be delayed, to say the least. Russia is afraid of losing its existing felons for that reason as well. All of this is a problem for Russia, should it get into a military contest with the United States. America's air fleet significantly outnumbers it, with over 13,000 combat aircraft between the different branches of the armed forces. The Su-57 cannot match the United States' premier fighters either. The F-22 Raptor and the F-35 Lightning II both have significantly lower radar cross-sections than any aircraft the Russians can bring to bear, and there were already 450 F-35s in American service by February 2022, according to a Congressional Budget Office report. Although the United States only has 187 Raptors in service and not all of them are ready for combat, each Raptor is worth at least several enemy aircraft. In an all-out air battle, the F-22 and F-35 would complement each other, with the Lightning II's unparalleled situational awareness helping the Raptor in its mission of achieving air dominance. Both planes are highly stealthy, with the F-35 having a cross-section of a metal golf ball, according to some reports from American military officials. The F-22 is a little more detectable, but only at a range of about 10 miles. Long before the enemy knew they were coming, both planes could launch long-range missiles at their targets and leave, which will especially be the case once they are armed with the coming AIM-260 Jatam, which has a range of 120 miles. The United States also has thousands of upgraded fourth-generation aircraft like the F-15 Eagle, F-16 Fighting Falcon, and the F-A-18 Super Hornet available. It is worth noting that the F-15 in particular has never been shot down in combat and the coming F-15EX will make it an even better aircraft. American pilots are also more extensively trained and experienced in the sky. According to the Flight International publication, American pilots get about 17 hours of flight time per month, adding to a little over 200 per year. This data is reflected in the flight times of common planes in the American fleet. For example, a typical F-15 gets about 300 to 400 flight hours per year, while the F-16 gets between 200 and 300. In contrast, Russian pilots get about 130 to 180 hours of flight time per year. The difference therefore ranges from 10 to 35 percent less, and there are more American pilots. The conclusion seems hard to escape that in the skies, the United States would have a significant advantage, and it would only be a matter of time before it establishes at least air superiority, although Russian air defense systems will remain a threat. In naval power, the balance between the two sides is also lopsidedly shifted in favor of the United States. The US Navy currently has 11 aircraft carriers, nearly half of the world's total of 24. 
In contrast, Russia only has one, the perennially problematic Admiral Kuznetsov, which has been undergoing repairs since 2018. The Russian Navy isn't up to par in other ways either. As of November 2023, it has 265 units in its fleet, with a median hull age of 31 years. It only has four cruisers, with the youngest of them being the 26-year-old Pyotr Veliki. Russia only has 12 destroyers, and they are also aging. The youngest is the 25-year-old Admiral Chabonenko, which is the only destroyer manufactured since the fall of the Soviet Union. The rest of the Russian Navy's surface ships are 11 frigates and 83 corvettes, the latter of which are vessels that typically have displacements between 500 and 2,000 tons. They are the smallest class of warship. These ships tend to be the newest in the Russian Navy. The implication of this is that as the Russian Navy retires its cruisers and destroyers, it is replacing them with lighter frigates and corvettes. Unfortunately, these lighter ships are not as well armed, not as well protected, and cannot stay at sea for as long because they carry fewer supplies. Because of this, Russia is steadily losing its blue water surface fleet and is less capable of projecting power in the world's oceans than it was in the past. Russia has 58 submarines. These vessels are in better shape than the surface fleet. However, 22 of these are diesel electric submarines. This means that although the two submarine fleets are similar in number, the American fleet will be quieter and have longer range. The United States has 68 submarines, all of which are nuclear-powered, making the American fleet quiet and capable of long-duration missions. The US Navy also has 22 cruisers and 70 destroyers, giving it superior power projection to Russia over long distances. The conclusion seems hard to escape that in a naval confrontation, the United States would have a significant advantage, with its more durable ships, longer range, and superior air power. The performance of Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where it's been forced to retreat from Sevastopol despite Ukraine's lack of a navy, suggests that things would not go well for the Russian Navy against the US Navy, to say the least. On the ground, things should be less lopsided, at least in theory. Russia has a long history of emphasizing a ground confrontation with NATO forces, and it is traditionally a land power. Its tank fleet is designed for such purposes. Before the war in Ukraine, it had the world's largest tank fleet, with over 12,500 units. This was more than twice the size of America's tank fleet, with 5,500 units. Russia's main tanks, the T-72, 80, and 90, were explicitly designed to overwhelm the enemy with sheer numbers and easily replaceable losses. Unfortunately for Russia, there are many problems with this massed approach to warfare. As early as the Gulf War in 1991, the United States proved that it could destroy Russian tanks in large numbers. At engagements like the Battle of 73 Easting, squadrons of Iraqi T-72 and other Soviet-type tanks were destroyed in exchange for only a few American casualties. The American Abrams tanks proved themselves superior. There are a few reasons for this. Crews in an Abrams tank are much better protected than those in the T-72 or its derivative designs. The Abrams keeps its ammunition stored in a sealed compartment, while the Russian tanks don't, which makes the latter's crew vulnerable to the entire magazine blowing up. The American tanks also have greater range than their Russian rivals thanks to their ability to raise their guns to higher angles. Russia could at least in theory mitigate some of these disadvantages with its newest tank, the T-14 Armata, which has a longer range, more powerful and flexible gun, and better protection for its crew than the T-72 and its derivatives. The problem for Russia is that only about 20 prototypes of the tank have ever been built. Because of the Armata's designs around an unproven engine, the A85-3, which was never used as a tank engine before, the Russian military has had a tough time producing the tank. But the most important reason why the war in Ukraine has proven that America would have an advantage in armor is not because of the technological or design edges, but because of how it uses its tanks compared to Russia. Russia's military doctrine descends from the Soviet concept of deep battle. Deep battle emphasizes wave upon wave of tanks crashing into an opposing battle line and achieving a breakthrough to keep things moving and avoiding a stalemate like that seen in World War I. Unfortunately for Russia, it means that tank drives are often improperly supported by infantry. The result was the embarrassment Russia suffered outside of Kyiv in the opening phase of the war, with stalled tank columns taking heavy casualties from entrenched Ukrainian defenders armed with drones and anti-tank weapons like the Javelin and Enlor. The result of Russia's tank doctrine has been the loss of thousands of armored units in the war. Such tank tactics would be a problem against the United States for two reasons. The first is because American forces operate under a combined arms doctrine. Tanks are supported by dismounted infantry, with two arms working closely together. 
This mutual support is particularly important in an urban setting, and the American military's experience in the counterinsurgency warfare in Iraq reinforced that notion. The second reason is that the classical tank versus tank battles that the T-72 and its derivatives were designed to excel in have proven rare on the modern battlefield. Tanks have instead had their most usefulness as support for infantry at the platoon or company level, rather than as grand divisional or corps units sweeping across battlefields. Tank warfare is now much more based on locating and destroying an enemy tank with drones, artillery, air support, or with ambushes from infantry holding portable anti-tank weapons than on tanks fighting each other at visual range. This is a type of warfare that the Russian tank forces have proven less than ideally suited to. Although Russia could, in theory, learn the lessons of Ukraine and earlier wars, it has proven remarkably stubborn in doing so. The Chechen Wars of the 1990s and early 2000s should have taught Russia the lessons, but Russian forces have not made use of them in Ukraine. And in any case, retraining under new doctrines takes a lot of time and institutional retooling. Russian tanks would therefore likely be outgunned by American tanks if they were to encounter each other. When things inevitably go wrong in tank drives, American infantry will be better positioned to capitalize and attack the stalled Russian armor, while being better able to protect their own armored units from similar Russian attacks. In an artillery battle, things might be a little less clear. The Russian military is, above all, an artillery force. In 2021, a RAND Corporation report cautioned that the U.S. Army's artillery program was in comparatively poor shape thanks to two decades of counterinsurgency-focused warfare seen in the War on Terror. In those campaigns, air and helicopter support were more important, while artillery personnel were often put on infantry-related duties. Rand concluded that these realities meant that today's American gunners were far less experienced than their pre-9-11 predecessors. As of 2024, global firepower indices show that Russia has 6,208 pieces of self-propelled artillery, 8,356 pieces of towed artillery, and 3,065 rocket-based artillery systems. In contrast, the United States has 1,595, 1,267, and 694, respectively. There is another problem. Air defense capabilities atrophied in the same way that field artillery did during the same era, as more resources were put into other arms, meaning that American air support, the now go-to way of providing fire support to land-based forces, would be in danger. While this made sense in counterinsurgency warfare, it leaves significant vulnerabilities in a peer or near-peer conflict against an adversary like Russia, whose artillery forces have not atrophied. One of the key findings in the RAND Corporation's report titled Army Fire's Capabilities for 2025 and Beyond says that, in a potential future conflict with Russia, US ground fires would face a variety of challenges, including being outranged and significantly outnumbered, limitations the Russians can impose on US target acquisition systems, the complexity of coordinating joint fires, and the need to preposition heavy equipment and ammunition. This report came out before the war, but one of the reasons Russia has been resilient despite taking hundreds of thousands of casualties in the conflict is because of its artillery. One of the few ways in which Russia has adapted adequately to the modern battlefield is in the use of precision-guided artillery. Because of shell depletion, Russia is not emphasizing its traditional saturation fire methods as much as it did when the war started. It has increasingly used laser-guided artillery, like the 152mm Krasnopol round, which is driven towards targets of opportunity by surveillance aircraft and specialized infantry. The result is that Russian artillery has become more accurate in striking important Ukrainian positions. RAND's report and assessments from Britain's Royal United Services Institute RUSI, suggest that American and NATO forces have relied too much on long-range precision-guided bombs dropped from aircraft as a method of fire support. This worked against insurgents and small states, but could pose extreme problems in a peer or near-peer environment, where the adversary has air defense systems like Russia's S-400. Russia does have some weaknesses, though. It has a centralized, top-down command structure that discourages initiative from junior officers. This is a problem in an artillery battle, as Ukraine's few HIMARS systems revealed in spectacular fashion in 2022. Russia has responded to this by moving its critical military infrastructure like command and control centers, fuel and ammunition depots, runways and barracks further away from the front line. In a full confrontation with the United States, there would be many more HIMARS to deal with. The US Army has about 540 HIMARS in service and plans to purchase 500 more by 2028. Additionally, the United States has longer-range missiles for its HIMARS than Ukraine has used. 
American HIMARS can use the ATACAMS ballistic missiles with a range of 300 kilometers. Additionally, the United States is now beginning to field the successor to the ATACAMS, the Precision Strike Missile, which can hit targets over 500 kilometers away. In a confrontation between Russia and the United States, the latter would need to move its critical military infrastructure even further back from the front line. This would likely contribute to the command and logistics problems in the Russian military. However, for all the powers of HIMARS, RAND is worried about the over-reliance on it. Rocket launchers such as MLRS and HIMARS are very important field artillery systems, but cannons are more appropriate for providing timely and continuous support to troops in contact. Among RAND's recommendations are increasing the number of field artillery units, modernization of the Army's cannons to give them higher rates of fire at longer ranges, and improving the survivability of artillery units against indirect fire, airborne, and ground threats. Russian firepower poses a significant threat to American forces. The United States will therefore need to bring combined arms operations and have good intelligence about Russian artillery positions in order to counteract them. Fortunately for the Americans, the war in Ukraine has revealed that the United States tends to have good intelligence on the Russian military. American provision of intelligence to the Ukrainians was one of the biggest reasons for their successes in 2022. With this information, the United States is in position to launch a cohesive combined arms operation against its opponent. Though Russia has a strong artillery force, the war in Ukraine has proven that without combined arms support, even the king of battle becomes humbler than it needs to be. Russia's artillery advantage in Ukraine has allowed it to grind forward, but at the cost of hundreds of thousands of casualties taken disproportionately against well-informed and armed Ukrainian units. The Russian military has shown a poor conception of combined arms operations. In contrast, the United States trains its forces to integrate infantry, armor, artillery, air support, and naval units into a cohesive web. Information is shared between all arms, allowing units best positioned to act to take advantage of emerging intelligence or enemy vulnerabilities. Russia's inability to coordinate its infantry, armor, artillery, and air units into a cohesive combined arms strategy has proven to be an enormous disadvantage in the war in Ukraine. Against an adversary with superior forces like the United States, the way the Russian military has conducted itself seems downright suicidal. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, the United States has superiority in logistics. The United States military has 10 support soldiers for every combat soldier. In contrast, Russia does not devote nearly as much effort to its logistics. We have seen Russia's difficulties in projecting power in its own backyard because of logistical inadequacies. Difficulty in keeping tanks fueled and repaired has contributed to thousands of them being abandoned. Russia's infantry has lacked proper body armor. Russian logistics have even had a problem with keeping its combat units fed. Looting for the means of survival has been common in Ukraine. Given that the United States would need to cross an ocean to get to the battlefield against Russia, the latter should have a significant advantage. But the logistical incompetence and corruption seen in the war in Ukraine makes this notion questionable. The United States has decades of experience projecting power around the world. As such, it would be well prepared to keep its forces in the field. The logistical experiences of the two countries in fighting wars abroad gives us a clear idea of which one would have the advantage. In Ukraine, Russian forces have been improperly and inadequately supplied. These have not proven problems for the United States military in any of its recent conflicts. Russia's artillery force remains a significant threat, and there is no doubt that in any real-world confrontation, it in particular would inflict significant casualties on American forces. Russia's local numerical superiority would also be a source of significant concern early in hostilities in Eastern Europe. However, the United States has a superior military, and it's only a matter of time before it would gain an advantage thanks to better technology, doctrine, air and naval support, and most importantly, logistical competency. Russia's grim experience in Ukraine has shown that. There's an old quote which has been attributed to Winston Churchill but may be apocryphal. Russia is never as strong as she looks. Russia is never as weak as she looks. Though of mysterious origin, this phrase accurately describes the tempo of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia was too weak to topple the government in Kyiv, but has thus far proven too strong to be defeated completely. However, this is still a conflict between a supposed great power and a small one. Against a superpower like the United States, Russia has shown too many disadvantages to pose a credible conventional military challenge. Any conflict with Russia would involve significant casualties, far more than the American public has become accustomed to since the Vietnam War, but the final outcome of a military confrontation would be in little doubt. 
What do you think about a potential full-scale military confrontation between the United States and Russia? How much of a threat would the Russian artillery forces be? How would logistics play a defining role? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Now go check out Could the US Military Conquer Russia All on Its Own? Or click this other video instead. And make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.